with you again another Thursday night. Just one more to go now next week. Where did the month go? But there we are, it flies. And we're turning to Luke chapter 9 tonight. But before I do that, I want to read, I was reading Psalm 19 today, and it really blessed me. And I just want to read a few of these familiar verses to you before we turn to Luke 9. Someone said to me years ago, if you want to get on, if you want to get on well with people, read the Proverbs, because they're on a horizontal level about how we react with other people. But if you want to worship the Lord, read the Psalms. They're vertical, as the psalmist cries to God. Psalm 19, listen, just as I read verse 7 to verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. What a lovely passage, and it thrilled my heart today, and I thought I would read it to you. Luke chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 57 through to the end of the chapter at verse 62. Luke 9, verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes of holes and birds of the air of nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but, thou, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto them, No man, having put his hand to the plough, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And amen. Some of you might have heard of the name John McCain. John McCain was a U.S. senator. He died in August 2018 at the age of 82. He was a highly decorated U.S. Navy officer. Uh, and he uh, stood for president on two different occasions, 2000 and 2008, I believe. But he was a highly decorated Navy officer, two Purple Hearts, uh, Silver Star, two Legions of Merit, and the list goes on. John McCain, during the Vietnam War, was held a prisoner of war in a North Vietnamese camp from 1967 until 1973, five and a half years. And the following is an extract from his autobiography. It says this, In the final years of our imprisonment, our captors moved us from small cells of one or two prisoners to large dorms of 30 to 40 men. This aided companionship and strength as we encouraged one another. In the larger rooms, we were allowed to receive packages and letters from home. In our cell was a Navy officer, Lieutenant Commander Mike Christian. And Mike, over a period, gathered pieces of red and white cloth from the packages prisoners received and sewed them into an American flag on the inside of his blue prison shirt. Every night in our cell, Mike put his shirt on the wall and we would pledge our allegiance to the flag of America. This went on every night until one night the Vietnamese guards came in while we were reciting our pledge. They ripped the flag from the wall. They dragged Mike out. He was beaten and kicked for several hours and thrown back into the cell. Later that night, as we were going to sleep on the concrete slabs we used as beds, 
I noticed Mike, still bloody and swollen from his terrible beating, gathering bits and pieces of cloth together, he was starting to sew a new American flag. Huh? Dear Saint of God and Ballysillan, when it comes to the things of God and putting first things first, that is the kind of commitment. That's the kind of determination. That's the kind of passion that the Lord expects from we, his followers. He expects us that in spite of the beatings and in spite, in, in spite of the valleys of, of problems and difficulties, that we keep on going. I think it was Brother Andrew wrote years ago that it's easier to cool down a fanatic than to warm up a corpse. And I know there's dangers with being fanatical. I understand that. And, and we in evangelical circles are scared of people getting too excited. But that is far better than being cold and indifferent to the things of God. And I agree with Brother Andrew. It's a lot easier to cool down a fanatic than it is to warm up a corpse. In this passage in Luke chapter 9, we have three would-be followers of Jesus Christ. Most local assemblies would have been delighted to give them what we would call the right hand of fellowship, a term taken from Galatians 2 and 9. In other words, we welcome them into membership. We welcome into the body, the local testimony. We give them the right hand of fellowship and a boost their ranks and it would seem like revival. But the Lord rejects all three of these would-be followers because they failed to get first things first. They failed in the spiritual priority. And these prospective disciples had to first count the cost of following Jesus Christ because Salvation is not just about a change of mind. It is that. Of course it is. But it is also a change of life. It's also a change of direction. It's a change of values. It's a change of purpose. It changes every part of our life. Following Jesus is not for the faint-hearted. And as we look at these three men, we can see that the first one, verses 57 and 58, this man failed in the area of sacrifice. This man, certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He failed in counting the cost as far as what sacrifice would be involved. The second man, verses 59 to 60, failed in the area of urgency. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. He failed to see the urgency of following Jesus Christ. And then the third man, verses 61 and 62, he failed in the area of intensity. Another said, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So these three men failed right at the start of their Christian journey because they failed to get first things First, they failed getting their priorities right. One man failed in the area of sacrifice. One man failed in the area of urgency. And another man failed in the area of intensity. And in our generation, God's requirements have not changed. Society has changed. But God's requirement has not changed. And so we find that in many of our fellowship, we find people who fail when it comes to sacrifice, fail when it comes to urgency, and fail when it comes to intensity. And so they cherry-pick the things of God. 
and they are enthusiastic when they want to be enthusiastic and they are less than involved when they don't want to be. And that's not the way it ought to be. There are many who will not put themselves out for the cause of Christ. In other words, they will let it fit into their lifestyle if it doesn't encroach, but, but they will not put themselves out for the cause of Christ. There's others who have no concept of the brevity of time and the urgency as we near the Lord's return. And so there's a lack of passion, a lack of burden that I ought to characterize and drive the child of God. When David Livingstone was in Africa in the 1840s and 1850s, a group of friends back in the UK wrote to David Livingstone and said to him, we would love to send other men to help you. Have you found a good road in your area yet? And he replied, if you only have men who will come if the road is good, I don't want them. I want men who insist on coming even if there is no road at all. Commitment. These men failed in sacrifice, failed in urgency, and failed in intensity. And I, I have been preaching now for a long time, 50 years, since I was saved at 16 and came to this assembly and started speaking all those years ago. And I have found that there are many people who think that Jesus came to give us something to do on a Sunday. To give us somewhere to go on a Lord's Day. It's as if that on the computer, if you can imagine it, all the wee icons on, in the front of the screen, and there's one that, that, that's marked God. And, and to open that particular icon, you have to close down all the other files that you might have, and you click on that, and it gets you into a world where there's the meetings and the hymns and the Bible and study and, and, and missionary work and, 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 uh, and giving, and, and, and there it is. Oh, it all comes up. But, but to go into any other area of your life, you have to close that one down. You close it down again, and then you open the other. And it's as if that, that God is just a wee island on its own, all the religious stuff. But I want to tell you, God sent his son so that he would take over our lives and permeate every area of our lives. He's there when we think and speak and give. And argue. He's, he's there in the workplace. He's there on holiday. He, he wants to be involved in every... It's as if the, the God icon should be the screensaver. It should be playing at the back of everything else that we do. That he's there. I want to mention three things to you tonight. I want to talk about the passion to follow Christ. I want to talk about the problem in following Christ. And I want to talk about the priority in following Christ. First of all, then, the passion to follow Christ. The Lord often told his congregation to follow me. Whenever he preached, he would challenge them. He would give an appeal, as it were, and he said, follow me. Some did, and others didn't. And I would imagine these three men, uh, somewhere along the line, have heard the Lord Jesus preach, and they've heard this appeal, follow me. And we are given no reason to doubt these men's sincerity or their genuineness. We must commend them. These men came and they, and they wanted to follow and they wanted to get involved. I mean, many of us don't get this far. Many of us fill in a weak card at a mission or put our hand up on a mission or, 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 or at our bedside we ask the Lord into his heart and it never moves any further than that. That's as far as it goes. 
But these men, I don't know whether they left their wives and families and I said, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to work today. I, I have something that I've got to do. I've got to find Jesus and I've got to tell him that I'm going to be a follower. That's good. They had a desire to follow close. They had a desire to hear his voice. They had a desire to know his plan and to sense his desire and to feel his heartbeat. Notice their passion. Verse 57. And as they went, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. That's good. I have to pat him on the back. Lord, wherever you go, I'm going to be there. Whatever you say, I'm going to listen to it. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll be there. He wanted to be in constant communication with the living Christ. In the words of W.C. Martin, W.C. Martin was a, an American Baptist pastor. He, he died at 50 after writing hundreds of hymns. And in 1900, this is the hymn that he wrote. Where he may lead me, I will go. For I have learned to trust him so. And I remember twas for me that he was slain on Calvary. Died at 50. Ah, oh, but the, do, you, do you hear the passion? I believe that's what John 15 is all about. Do you remember that parable, uh, uh, the I arms of Christ? And he says, I am the true vine. Remember? And he says about being grafted into the vine. And, and if you are not grafted in, then you're cut away and burnt. But if you're grafted in and you abide in me, then you bear fruit. And this is all about the passion of, of being grafted into Christ. That's where we get our resources. That's where we get our strength. That's where we get our nutrients. That's where we get our spiritual life. In Christ. We are not divine. No, we have been grafted in the moment we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The passion to do whatever he wants you to do. To go wherever he wants you to go. To endure whatever he wants you to endure. To walk in the valley where he wants you to walk. He says in verse 58, the foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. This ought to be the passion of every Christian. This is our number one priority. And if I was to do a pie chart, and I have to say, I have absolutely no scripture for this. This is just off my head. But if we were to have a pie chart, could I suggest that half, 50% of the pie is for God? He has to have the priority. And then 20% is our spouse, if we have a spouse. And then 10% is the it's the children. So we're up to 80% now. And then 5% is self, and 5% is others, and 5% is our service, and 5% is our career, and there's your 100%. God gets priority. I remember when I was up in Balamina preaching it came a time for holidays. I used to look forward to holidays. Still do, but my life's a holiday now being retired. Yeah. But I used to look forward to holidays. Why there was no midnight phone call. Somebody has got hurt or somebody's ill. Somebody's in hospital. Somebody's dying. And, and, and now to this day, if the phone goes in the middle of the night, I'm wide awake in an instant because you never get good news in the middle of the night. It's always bad news. But oh, the holidays, somebody else took the call. They knew not to ring me. But I remember going, standing, shaking hands at the door and people were coming out and some were saying, have a nice holiday and have a good time. And make sure you relax and and one man came out and he says, you know, 
It's better to wear out than to rust out. I said, uh, I said, neither of those are biblical. Either burning out or rusting out. The Bible says we're to live out. Huh? I says we shouldn't be burning out. And we shouldn't certainly be rusting out, but we're to live out. And he says, well, Satan doesn't take a holiday. And I stopped, I got his shoulder, and I said, brother, since when did we take our example from the devil? It's not the way we should be taking our advice. The Lord said, come ye apart and rest away. And we have to look after we've only the one body. And we have to make sure that we're wise and sensible. But oh, there ought to be a passion. And even when, uh, when I'm on holiday, even whenever I have a Sunday off, even when I'm not, there's, there's, a, there's a built-in passion to reach others and to tell them of the Savior who's mighty and willing and able to save to the uttermost. So the passion to follow Christ. Then secondly, we want to look at the problem in following Christ. You see, the man, number one, put no time delay in following. He just hadn't been prepared for the sacrifice involved. He says, I will follow thee wherever thou goest. But he hadn't really thought it through. And the Lord had to remind him of the cost involved. But the man number two, he had a problem with the urgency of it all. Verse 59, and he said to another, follow me, give the appeal. But he says, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. There was something else in this man's life that had primary priority. It, it was not, I believe, that his father was dead and that he was rushing home to organize the wake and organize a funeral. No, that's not the idea here. No, he's asking for a delay until after he fulfills his family responsibilities whenever his parents pass. That's the idea. He, he's looking maybe 20 years down the road, maybe 30 years, maybe, maybe 40 years down the road. And he said, just you, I'm, I want to serve you, I want to live for you, I want to follow you, but, but there's other things that really need to, for me to attend to them. And the sad reality is that many of us want to live for God faithfully. Maybe as a missionary, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe an encourager, maybe a prayer warrior, maybe a supporter. But somehow Satan makes sure that we can't do it just yet. That, that there's, there, there's something else in the way. Now, it, it's not an excuse. And that, that would be unscriptural. It would be ungodly. No, no, it's a legitimate delay. It, it's a genuine issue. issue. It's a, a plausible fear. A rational priority. The problem is that we put it off. You know, I often think about the woman. Do you remember that first Easter morning? And the three women are making their way to the tomb. And as they walk, they're not talking about his miracles. They're not talking about his preaching. They're not talking about the people that were healed. Huh. What were they talking about that morning? They were talking about who shall roll away the stone. You see, if that had to be me, once I realized, I said, ladies, what, what are we doing? Oh, barely in the morning. There's a stone in the way. Come on, let's get back to home, back to bed. But these ladies, even though there was an obstacle, even though there was something and a hindrance that was in the way, they kept on going and they kept on walking and they didn't turn back. Isn't that wonderful? Determination. You see, they could have said, well, Joseph of Arimathea, he's wealthy. I mean, he's enough money to buy the spices and, and to buy the, the, the linen cloth and, and his tomb. I mean, he, he's already done it all. But these women wanted to show their love 
And so they bought the spices sacrificially. And they said, no, we're going to anoint them. And as they walked that first Easter morning, so easily they could have turned back and said, well, sure, there's a stone in the way. But interestingly, as they were faithful in going, the Lord removed the stone. The Lord removed them. And they were able to see the empty tomb and see the evidence of the resurrection. They were able to see the power that raised them from the dead. Persistence. And so across the church tonight, we are big on talk, big on ideas, big on advice, but very short on action. You know, whenever at a congregation, I was convinced that every congregation had a Statler and a Waldorf. You know who Statler and Waldorf is? They're in the Muppets, the two old boys that were up on the balcony. Huh? <laughs> and they sat up in the theater box and were cantankerous and complained all the time and heckled. They never were on the stage. They were never doing anything. No, they just sat up in the box and criticized. Eh? I think every congregation has. I, I don't, I'm not asking for a show of hands, please. <laughs> the Statler and Waldorfs of this world never involved the problem in following Christ. Always there with a critic, always there with a problem. Every fellowship seems to have them. The problem in discipleship is that we are experts at procrastinating and finding fault with the action and the involvement of others. And I've often said to people when they find fault with what I was doing, I would say, I prefer my way of doing it than your way of not doing it. <laughs> Some people you can't win. I remember David will be well aware of this whenever my youngest girl has a failed marriage. Their marriage didn't last a year. It went wrong in their honeymoon. Started womanizing, drinking. Broke her heart. And we tried to counsel. We promised the world. And in less than a year, she rang me up one day. She says, Dad, come and bring me home. And I did. And I was trying to prepare sermons and messages and hearing my daughter in her 20s crying herself to sleep in her bedroom. Phone went one night. It was a man from the fellowship. He said, Pastor, can I ask you a question? I said, of course you can. He said, is Naomi at home? I said, yes, she is. He says, well, I'm not happy. I said, okay. Why are you not happy? He says, you're condoning sin. I says, well, let, you, let me say a few things. Number one, it's my daughter, not yours. Number one, not your problem. It's my problem. It's my daughter. It's not your daughter. You look after your family, I'll look after my family. That's number one. Number two, where would my daughter be tonight if I didn't bring her in? Would you prefer she was in a shop doorway somewhere? Would you prefer that she was out walking the streets tonight? And I said, number three, I said, I've spent all my ministry preaching on the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Why would I not show it to my own daughter? Hmm? He says, well, I'm not happy. And away he went. I'll tell you something. It was hard preaching the next Sunday with him sitting in the congregation. But I felt like going down. Huh? Eh? The problem of following Christ. People who want to have their say but don't want involved. The Lord wants us in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our worries, in the midst of our restrictions and fears, to bow before him and with an honesty and with a determination say, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever, however, whenever that takes me. You're my number one Priority. Sadly today, 
there is more zeal among the LGBT followers and more passion among the pro-abortion groups than there is among God's people. Remember David in the Valley of Elah? And he arrives to bring supplies to his brothers. And he hears Goliath shouting his defiance against the children of Israel. And David says, there's nobody going to call. And his big brother Ab says, you've just come here to, to see the battle and, and you've left the sheep in, in the wilderness. David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Is there not something to fight for? This is the name of Jehovah. And in 1 Samuel 17, isn't it? 39 or thereabouts. Is there not a cause? Have we nothing to fight for? Dear friend, we have the truth wrapped up in Jesus Christ. We have the answer to the need of the human heart. We have it. We have it in our lives. We have it in the Word. We have it in our Bible. And the Lord said on one occasion, whenever the Pharisees wanted the Lord to calm down his, his followers, the Lord says, if they would stop, the very stones would pray. The passion to follow Christ. Lord, I'll follow you wherever, whenever, however. That's my number one priority. The the Problem in following Christ. The second man, he put it off. And then the priority in following Christ. Verse 61 and 62 sounds harsh. Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but first let me go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. That seems rational, doesn't it? It seems fair enough. And Jesus said to him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Surely there's nothing wrong with saying goodbye to his family. But, but the Lord Jesus, with divine insight, sensed something more in his request. He sensed a divided heart. He sensed that part of this man wanted to go, but part wanted to stay. His heart was being pulled in two directions. He loved his family. He loved the Lord. And, and it was being, he was being torn in two. James, of course, talks a lot about this. Let me tell you, James 4 and 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your heart, ye double-minded. In chapter 1 of James, but let him that ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. For let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so on. And so we find the priority is to make sure that there's nothing, no divided loyalties and that Christ is first. Judson Deventer was born in the 5th of December, 1855, I think. He studied art. It was his passion. He studied under a famous German artist called Paul Kiedel. Judson was a believer, but he never considered full commitment or getting too involved. He said, the Lord understands, uh, the Lord is not an ogre. Uh, and so he became an art teacher. At a revival meeting, God convicted him about his casual attitude to his faith. So he tried to reset the balance. And the, on top of his teaching, he started to take speaking engagements in local churches. But God kept convicting him. Until in 1896, at the age of 41, he lifted his pen and wrote a song that you sing. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I surrender 
And then when I was just a Christian at 16, I used to go to meetings, especially missionary meetings, hear about what God was doing in Africa or Japan or China. And as I sat in the meeting, I was, I was on the altar. <laughs> I was, uh, Lord, whatever, wherever. But by the time I got to the door, I was off the altar again. And then the next time the missionary came, and there was another great presentation of the needs, and I was on the altar. But by the time I got into the car and got the radio on, I was off the altar again. I was off, and I was like, a yo yo. And then I was reading, and I read that the sacrifice was tied with cords to the horns of the altar. And I realized that whenever the, the sacrifice went on the altar, it never was getting off again. It was tied by cords to the horns on each four corners, to the horns of the altar. And I realized whenever I was back on the altar, I was never getting off again. And I remember it. Going to the meeting, hearing a missionary, saying, Lord, whether my life is long or short, whether I'm able or unable, whether I'm good or bad, I'm yours. I'm yours. And 45 years later, Still on the altar. Tied with cords to the horns of the altar. No getting off. I mentioned Brother Andrew at the start of the meeting. Listen to this. Brother Andrew, this is from his book, The Calling. It says, we were planning to smuggle one million Bibles into China, wanting to be sure that the believers in the country realized the immensity of the task and were willing to accept the risks. We, went, we sent Joseph, a Chinese team member, to meet with five key house church leaders. They said, do you know how much space one million Bibles take up? Joseph asked. We already have prepared the storage places, they replied. Do you know what could happen to you, Joseph continued, if you were caught even with a portion of these Bibles? Joseph, they said, all five of us have been in prison for the Lord. Altogether, we have spent 72 years in jail for Jesus. We are willing to die if it means that a million brothers and sisters have a copy of God's Word. With tears in his eyes, Joseph folded up his long list of questions and put them away. Huh? First things first. Matthew 6, four weeks ago, stop worrying. Look at the food. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about fashion. Look at the flowers. Look at the fire. Seek first the kingdom of God and his race, and all these other things will be added on. Don't worry. Then Matthew 23, stop pretending. Speaking of the Pharisees and the scribes, clean that first which is within. Clean the heart. Get to the heart of the matter. And then the outward will be fine. And then Matthew 22. That wasn't stop worrying or stop pretending. That was stop cheating. And he was talking about the hypocrisy, the actors. And he says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. Stop worrying, stop pretending, stop cheating. Tonight in Luke 9, stop waiting. Stop waiting. Follow Jesus Christ with passion in spite of the problems and give it the priority. There's an intensity, an urgency, a priority 
the following Jesus. And we'll come up with another one, God willing, for next week. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. And Father, we sometimes feel it's a bit disjointed. But Father, we pray that something said tonight will be used of thee to minister and feed our hearts. Oh, our Father, so often we talk a good talk. Father, help us to walk the walk. Help us to follow you in such a way that people will be confused and amazed as we live in this cruel, sinful world with an integrity that points to thee. Bless each one. Father, I don't know the needs in the meeting. You do. Maybe some praying for wayward children, wayward grandchildren who never come to church anymore. Maybe worried about loved ones. Father, we just gather them all up. Like the four men who brought the paralytic man and they went to the roof and they dug a hole in the roof and lowered him down at your feet. Father, we do that tonight. We gather them all up. We lay them at your feet. We pray you'll meet their need. Take us home in safety. Bless each one for Christ's sake. Amen.